So I've shared several different videos around weathering techniques, but today we're going to get into the essential tools that one actually needs in order to start the process of weathering. And that's coming up on GC's Rip Track. Hi there, my name is John and welcome to JC's Rip Track. If you're looking for tips and advice on how to transform your plastic models into something that you would find on the rails today, then please hit subscribe and that little bell icon so you can be notified anytime I upload a new video. So what do you consider to be the essential tools that you need to weather your models? Please let me know in the comments section down below. To be honest, the tools and materials that one can use with weathering can be really wide ranging. So much so that I can't even cover them in one video and I'd actually have a very short repertoire in this channel if I did. Rather, keeping in mind that a certain season of gift giving is coming up shortly, what I wanted to do was provide a list of essential tools that one needs in order to get started with weathering. These tools are what I consider to be the starting point or the need to have in order to start weathering. Once I've finished that, then I'm going to cover briefly a little bit of what I call the nice to have. And some of them might surprise you. When it comes to essential tools for weathering, the very first thing that you want to have more than anything else are paintbrushes. Now you do not need this many. This is just brushes that I have accumulated over the, uh, over the years, and this isn't even necessarily all of them. Uh, some of these are worn out, some of them I just happen to use, but paintbrushes. This is your basic weathering tool, and they come different sizes, uh, being from small to large, um, and depending on, on what you're doing them, they also come in, in, different, uh, in different shapes. The other thing is, one of the things that when it comes to paintbrushes that I would re highly recommend is that you not only have uh, a special set of paintbrushes, like paintbrushes for acrylics, which is what these are, but also you really need to have a separate set of, of brushes for doing uh, oil work. And specifically, these ones have a, a few more different shapes, like a chisel, a flat, uh, but also the, uh, the small, uh, narrow one. When it comes to t uh, your brushes, <coughs> keep acrylics and oils and keep them separate. Uh, it just makes it easier that way in terms, uh, in terms of caring for the brush and, and what you can do with it. The other thing that I want to talk about when it comes to brushes, don't go cheap. These are your primary tool for both painting and weathering. And so you want to get a chance to get a good quality sable, um, sable hair brush if, uh, if you can. This is more important for acrylic paints than it is for oils. For acrylics, you really want that, ki that kind of uh, precision for the type of work that, you, that you're doing with your brush. For oils, it's less important because oils tend to be a little bit more uh, forgiving. When it comes to brushes, you've, you've seen this great big pile of brushes that I have there, but I'm gonna, let me share with you these ones. Uh, these brushes right here are really my, my pride and joy. These are Winsor Newton Series 7 brushes, and these ones are expensive. These ones will run upwards of $20, even for a small brush like this. Like I have a, the a double zero and a triple zero. These are both in the miniature line, so they have uh, their, their bristles are shorter, but I've had these for 10 years. They are far and away, they are still the best brush uh, that, I, uh, that I have. In this, in this set, I also happen to have um, a, f uh, a third one that is um, uh, in, in the mix here. Uh, and there we are. Um, and that the, the, the bristles on it are slightly longer, uh, as you can see there. This is an example of why a good quality brush matters. These ones have outlasted every other brush that, I, that I've got. I've had to replace or retire any of the other brushes that I have because the, 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 the tip sort of uh, begins to f fray out. Even after 10 years, look at the nature and the tip of, the, uh, the tip of this brush. So again, these are, these are, no, these brushes are the top of the line. They don't, uh, you don't get them any better than this. One of the things when you're looking with uh, brushes also, uh, my suggestion is these ones have been manufactured by, uh, by Games Workshop, a lot of them that I have, but really for the types of brushes that you want, when you go into an artist shop, don't look for brushes that are for acrylics, look for them for watercolors. And that will give you a better idea, especially when you're painting, painting for acrylics on models. That's the kind of brush that, uh, that you want. So with, uh, with brushes set, uh, set aside, 
One of the things that, of course, you will also need are basically sponges. And sponges you can get from the end of a, a foam brush, but this is also for, uh, for doing weathering. Not only uh, can you get sponges, this is just from uh, basic sponges from packaging. But the types of uh, sponges you can also get are makeup sponges. You can get it at a drugstore, which are quite easy. You just tear and rip them, tr uh, rip them and then uh, they can be dabbed on the model to get that kind of, uh, the kind of chipping effect that you've, uh, you've seen in the chipping tutorials. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about is a paint palette. And I have two of them. Uh, <clears throat> this one is for acrylics, this one is for oils. And you notice that there's a considerable difference uh, between the two. That's one of the reasons I always like to keep uh, oils and acrylics separate. Uh, just, it's a better idea uh, to do that. Every once in a while, I have to really treat this one and, uh, and revamp it because uh, uh, the paint does build up on this. But this shows, one of the reasons why this one is as messy as it is, is that acrylics dry a lot faster than oils do. And oils you can clean up, and that's why this tray tends to look better. But it, it doesn't necessarily matter the size. You just need wells for your paint to put in and it just kind of keeps it there. Uh, occasionally I have used something called a wet palette, uh, which I'm not gonna show here, but that's something that's a little bit more advanced for when you're actually doing brush work on, on miniatures. But again, paint palette, one for acrylics, one for, uh, one for oils, and um, that's, that's kind of, uh, that's also essential tools, especially brush and palette. And of course, you need paint. And the, there's, of course, the two major types of paints. I'm gonna talk acrylics uh, in, the, in this case. And the, the, these are just a, a smattering of some, uh, some different brands that, uh, that I, I happen to have. Uh, Games Workshop, I use a lot of uh, AK Interactive, Vallejo um, as, as part of this, and uh, Privateer Press. These are the primary acrylics that I use. Don't, don't let that uh, discourage you from the different paint brands that you use. I, these ones are, uh, tend to be good, qu good quality paints. Um, they're highly pigmented especially, and so you can apply them thin and they will, they will cover well. And so in, that's for, for acrylics. Now, I also have, uh, I, the paint brand I also use a lot of here, of course, is Tamiya. Now, I use this primarily for airbrushing. I don't suggest using Tamiya paints for brushing. If you're gonna brush paint, use one of these other brands, whereas these ones, use for airbrushing. That's, that's sort of the, differ, uh, the difference that I, that I make. So, but they're still a good quality paint, but they're primarily an, an airbrush paint. Now, when it comes to oil paints, oils are extremely versatile for weathering effects. At one time, I was afraid of them, but now I consider them to be an essential as acrylic paints, especially when it comes to weathering. I've already mentioned various colors in previous videos, but if you go to an art supply or craft store, you can pick up a package of all the essential oils that you need. The only caution that I put here is stick with the traditional oils rather than the water mixable oils. And of course, there are specialty oil paints, such as the Abtalung 502, which are specifically intended for modelers. And they are good, and I do recommend them, but you don't need them. But, of course, when you're working with oils, you also need to have some sort of odorless thinner. This happens to be called Taltine. It's an odorless solvent for, uh, for oils, and it works, it works very well. Now, of course, with acrylics, <coughs> the only thinner that you really need there is, uh, is water. When it comes to actual paint brands, use what is best for what you happen to have on hand. Now, don't be afraid to explore and expand your horizon. And you see, for many decades, model railroaders used polyscale or flocal brands, which I happen to have a couple of examples here. Model railroaders tended to use these exclusively almost un uh, right up until they were unexpectedly discontinued in 2013. And that created a bit of an end of the world panic, especially if you go back and read some of the forums uh, from, from the day. In my case, I re-entered model railroading from a gaming background, and I had already been well aware of several different paint brands, such as the ones that you that you see here. And I have only a limited exposure to the polyscale and fl flocal brands. But even Games Workshop, they changed their formulations and uh, and their uh, and their formulas back in tw 2013. So I'm I'm aware of how brands can change. And one fallback to that is to make sure that you don't get married to one particular brand of paint. The reality is there are more paint lines on the market today than there ever have been. The choice and types of colors and quality is enormous and worth several videos alone. And I will be covering more of these paint lines uh, in depth in future videos. 
Now when it comes to clear coats, I covered them in a video on model preparation. But if you don't have a, an airbrush, most of the clear coats that you're going to be applying, you can be used with a rattle can. And in this case, testers dull coat as a flat coat or using gloss coat as well. There are some other brands that you can, uh, that you can work with, but the primary thing is to remember matte satin gloss in terms of from dull to, uh, to shiny. Now that I've covered the essentials, I'm gonna now move into what I call the nice to have category. One of the things that I, the very first thing, I almost put this in the need to have, but really one doesn't absolutely need it, but a color wheel. A, a color wheel is very, very useful in terms of understanding the relationships of different colors through uh, what are called the either complementary, triads, split complementaries, or various color arrangements. This actually helps in, uh, in weathering. Say, for example, if you have a, a blue car, you can see what you can apply in order to help the, the fading on, on that particular car. It's more than just simply spraying, spraying in a, a shade of off-white. Uh, the other thing is it also tells you how to uh, achieve certain, uh, certain colors and color blending. Uh, so as I said, a color wheel is a very valuable tool, but it's nice to have. Now, the other thing that you've seen me use a little bit is also specialty washes and, uh, and various effects. And so, you know, you have, you've seen me use these, uh, you have the, the, these, uh, these different, uh, different effects. Uh, this is uh, chipping fluid right, uh, right here. Uh, and as part of that also, and I don't seem to have the bottle near, uh, nearby, but uh, hairspray. Uh, and really that's all the, uh, the hairspray techniques um, you know, that's essentially what this is. But one of the reasons why uh, Ammo by Meg and other companies actually created uh, this kind of chipping fluid is, to, is that hairspray brands tend to vary from country to country, and this was a way to, to get it consistent. So uh, I haven't actually tried this, but I'm gonna be trying it uh, fairly soon on uh, one, of my, uh, one of my future videos is to just uh, show you how the, the, the chipping fluid actually works as part of the weathering process. You may have noticed that so far in these videos, I haven't used uh, weathering pigments or pastels yet. Well, that's not entirely true. Watch the videos from the Down and Dirty Weathering Contest and you can find two places where I made use of them. Now, I will be doing more on, uh, on weathering pigments and powders. And as you can see, I have some from uh, the original MIG Productions. Uh, I have some from Forge World. Uh, and I also happen to have, as many of you may recognize this, I also happen to have uh, a, a set of Bragdon weathering pigments. Now I do, I do have others, but as I've said, you've, no, you've probably noted that I haven't made use of them yet in any of the videos. One of the reasons why I've, I've done that is I regard the use of weathering pigments as an intermediate or even an advanced weathering technique because they are actually much more difficult to use than I think many of us realize. But because they've been used for so long, that usually they tend to be the first, the first thing that many people think that they have to get in order to weather. These are not essential. Everything else that you've seen up until this point, these are nice to have, but they are not a need to have. Now another nice to have, but not a need to have, is of course the airbrush. But when it comes to weathering with an airbrush, as I said, this is a nice to have, not a need to have. In fact, on the Rust Bucket forums, an online weathering community that I'm a part of, many of their members don't even own an airbrush. More often I use it for applying clear coats rather than using the rattle cans. But as you saw, there are a couple of techniques where it does come in handy. On the other hand, an airbrush goes from a nice to have to a need to have when you actually get into painting. Since I'm going to be starting a series on painting soon, I'm going to be doing an airbrush advice video next week. So hopefully you can slide this as a gift idea in front of whoever needs to see it. There's a lot to consider when getting an airbrush, which is why it needs its own video. But as far as weathering is concerned, you need a brush more than you need an airbrush. In the end, the only real tool that you really need when it comes to weathering is simply a paintbrush. Now it is essential that you get the right tool for the job, but the tool won't do the job for you. It just might make it a little bit easier. I also hope that the difference between the need to have and the nice to have gets you started on the right footing. And I hope you found this helpful. And if you're looking for tips and advice on how to get the most of your painting and weathering projects, then please hit subscribe and click that little bell icon so you can be notified anytime I upload a new video. And if you haven't already, please check out the other videos on this channel, especially the Weathering Basics playlist if you're looking to get started. So thanks for watching, good luck, 
and may you keep on track. 